Architectural Builder Supply is pleased to present you with this recording of the technical question that is listed in the title of this video. This call may be monitored and recorded for quality assurance. I'm trying to buy a couple of um, Rockwood uh, Walmart door stops. Okay. You have one in stock, I need two. That, that probably makes more sense because the ones in Naples to drop ship it for me if they I spoke to Rockwood this morning. They they have 6,000 in stock. They think they probably have them in their California warehouse, which is just down the road from me. Awesome. Could be here in a day. Yeah. Yeah. So Corey sent me a Rockwood. PDF with the – pardon me, sorry? So you spoke to Rockwood. I did. Okay. And what's the part number of the wall stop? It's RM860. 630, uh, 630 status yeah. stainless. So did they mention to you their minimum order? No. Okay, so that's going to be the problem. Have, there's 100. Because I, 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 I told them, I told them too. They told me they've, you know. Yeah. They didn't seem to think yeah, that was going to be a problem. Yeah, we're, we won't drop ship two of those because of the minimum order charge that they have. Okay. Yeah. I can order two, bring them in, that kind of thing, two weeks. Oh, that's unrealistic. It, it'd be more than two weeks. It'd probably be three. I could ship you one, order a second, ship that one to you when it came in. God, this is going to be a problem for everybody. I mean, I'll, I'll try to call Rockwood back because they had... Oh, it's they no had, problem. It's, it, and I'm the owner of this company. It's it, it's no, I, I'm, no problem. I, so I saw you in, uh, showing this in your video, right? On YouTube. Uh, absolutely. Cool. Yeah. So thank you for doing that. Very cool product, and you know, I'll tell you the crazy history of this. Uh, I spoke to Corey a couple of days ago, no Monday, and you know, he didn't tell me about a minimum order for dropship. He just said he had one in stock, and it's like three weeks. You know, we're trying to pull off this project in a couple of days. Um, there's a local company who claimed they had it in stock, but they took my money and uh, they didn't even put an order with Rockwood. So I don't know, sketchy uh -huh. Lux store. Um, called Rockwood to basically see if they put the order and they hadn't. But at that time, Rockwood was like, we have an order for four, we have an order for 10, we have an order for one. The, you know, and I'm, presumably that's going to stores and not drop ship um, from what you tell me. So they, you know, suggested I, I talked to some local that. people here. What was that? I didn't say that. Those, I didn't say those words. I don't Sorry, know Richard, what did Rockwood, I miss? What Rockwood, you said that's what you're telling me about those Order for one, order for ten, order for three. I I didn't say that. All I'm saying is if you no, need I'm, two, I'm assuming I, I've, I've got to give one that, more before I ship it to you. That's right. I'm assuming from what you told me that you know those are all people oh. ordering for their clients, right? You've got to, you're got to assuming go to that. Though. Okay, I understand. I am. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I've I've got one. Does one help? Um. Not really. <laughs> Maybe. What about changing the design? You know, there's lots made. of... This is, you know, you, you've handled it, so let me ask you. I mean, this seems to be a substantial... In addition to the fact that it's more elegant and more architectural, I live in, um, you know, uh, Conrad Buff's last house. So he's one of the case studies architects out here. So it's a super architectural house. It's an 80s brutalist house. And so... You know, they chose all the hardware very carefully, so and almost probably probably very carefully and and analyzed and studied it for time. You know, some of their sure other clients you're... have told me they they took them out to shop for garbage, you know, for tra okay. for paper bins for the house. So they were, you know, it looks to be substantially better designed and better built than the typical pressed steel, you know. You know, convex ones that there's a million of versions of them out there, including one from Rockwood. Um, this looks like a solid base. It just looks substantially can, better built and better engineered. Yeah. Can, can I just better save save potentially a lot of trouble and tell you sure. that? Can you use 626 finish? Because if you can, I've got six in stock. Um, 626 is satin chrome? Yes, it is. Well, satin, 626 means three things. One of those three things is satin chrome. So 
So what is, I'm just trying to pull back up the Asa Ablo site where I was no, no. looking. What is, which one? Oh, six, go to six? my website, absupply.net. Okay, cool. Got it. And then search RM860. And then scroll down to about the fifth item from the bottom. Okay. So did you say 613? No. Uh, fifth item from the bottom should be 626. 626, satin chrome. So this is satin chrome over brass? That's two of the three parts. And the third part is that it would have a lacquer on it, which if I sent you 626 without telling you, you wouldn't tell the difference between that and 630, meaning it's... You're not, you don't see a lot of it. You know what I mean? It's not, well, I shouldn't say you know what I mean because I don't know that you know what I mean. There is so little exposed of the architectural metal that discerning the difference between 630 and 626 would be more difficult as a result. Got it. So, um, what I would say is that this is for an exterior application. Perfect. Which is why I was looking for stainless steel. Well, not yeah, a problem. Uh, well, well, I live in Florida. I mean, even type 316 stainless is going to fatigue. Um, but 626 is non-ferrous, so that's good. It is, that is good. taught in our industry that 630 is the most durable of all finishes because it's natural, meaning all we've done is taken solid stainless and brushed it. However, in your case, maybe... You know, you'd have to decide. You want stainless, you're looking at three weeks. You want satin chrome, great. But solid brass is used in exterior applications because of that reason. So let me ask you about, um, do you stock, you know, the 10BE, the the satin bronze? Because the, the actual architectural finish on all these Thunderbird windows in this house, all these sliders and Thunderbird windows, is a dark bronze. I don't know whether the oxidized the satin, oxidized well, oil rubbed. Well, the 10BE is not oil rubbed. It's 10BE equivalent, and that's code for it's powder coated. I see. Um, and the answer is I don't stock that in anything other than 626 and 630. Okay. All right. For my application, these are exterior. There is a little bit of exposure to moisture on one of them, but both of them are effectively covered. But, you know, we've been having much, much more rain in California, some torrential rains that don't last very long. So there is some water exposure. I'm not at the ocean. I'm in Pasadena. I'm quite a ways inland, so it's not really going to be exposed to salt in any way. You would recommend uh, I just go with the satin chrome. Um. Uh, like I said, you need to make that decision. Satin chrome right. in stock. Stainless is going to be about three weeks. If it was me and I had the luxury of time, I'd probably wait for stainless. Okay. But if I didn't have the luxury of time, I really wouldn't hesitate to order satin chrome. Well, look, what I would say is we're not really going to probably make my builder deadline now anyway. Okay. I think that you're one of the only people that actually stocks this stuff. I realize everybody else is out there claiming they do, but they're actually just drop shipping it or ordering it and passing it on, right? So, um, and by the way, it's funny. Um, I came to you first, and then obviously somebody else claimed that they had it locally, and then uh, Asa Abloy sent me to a local distributor and who doesn't deal with the public and to Granger, and Granger was like, you should just buy it from AB. Those guys are great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it you know, yeah, and, and the same for Granger, it's just, you know, I don't try to sell motors, you know, or right. you know, uh uh winches for bulldozers, you know, we're we're door guys here, you know, five generations in fact. So, you know, we stay in our lane and we know what we do. Look, is there another product since you are door guys? I I'm looking at this and I think for the build quality and for the design I don't see anything else like it that's a minimalist, particularly for an 80s, modern, you know, super architectural house. I think this is the part I need. But you can tell me if there's something else that you stock that might also work. Um, you could, if you're going to special order something anyway, you yeah. probably should look in the Rockwood um, 
uh, architectural catalog, it's called. There's accessories okay. and then architectural. And if you get to the back of that catalog, you're, um, you're going to find the RM860 and its sister products. Got it. Look, I think I'm going to end up ordering the 630 from you, but I'll look at the catalog um, now. Um, thank you. And I'll call you back, and I presume it's going to be a month from now by the time I see this, this pair, right? Something in that unless range. Unless I order the one now. On, or unless you ordered four of them, because then it would be over the minimum to drop ship. Interesting. So Maybe I should order four. <laughs> <laughs> or or they become fifty dollars each, you know, so that you've got yeah, that's you've exactly got at least right. four op you've got five options in front of you. So you know. So Rich, let me ask you the question then. You know, because it's a day away, you know, if they have it in Southern California, which they Rock would believe they did this morning, um, but couldn't confirm for a certainty, how much does it cost to drop ship it for me? It's probably cheaper than having it come from Florida, right? Dimes. It's not not a big deal. I mean, it's not, you know, what's the difference between 15 and $17? It's Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah. Because I think Corey was quoting me something like, you know, $55 for one to come from Florida. So, you know, that, it may make I, more sense just to have the four drop shipped. Yeah, that that's not, that's not right. Corey, I've known Corey a long time. He's not quoting $55 for ground freight. It was for three days. Oh, well, well, that makes sense, for, yeah. Yeah, you're going to buy some gas fuel. Yeah. 65 for three day. Yeah. You know, when 55 or whatever, you know, that's what he was quoting me. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. The, the jet fuel is worth more than the wall stops at that point. Yep. Absolutely. So that's why knowing that the minimum is, you know, is four, it might be equally, you know, it might be better to buy four and have them drop ship them from California, right? and pay for the jet fuel to have the one come out and then have to do another one later. If what if Rockwood is correct and they've got them out there, that's a win. Okay, cool. So, you know, I spent some time with one person at Rockwood this morning, and while well, she confirmed 6,000 generally in stock, she felt pretty sure, but she couldn't tell me for a certainty, which, you know, for whatever their system was or the person I was talking to. So is there a way to confirm that before we order the form? Calling them back. Uh, okay. Or I can sending do that. me an email and say, "Hey, find out," and I will find out. Um, it's I can very. Do that too. It's in my experience of 25 years of dealing with Rockwood, they are never unsure of anything. They're they're among the best trained in the industry for sure. So I find it unusual. It could just be that there was a that they couldn't log into something they needed at that moment. Cause okay. They're good. Yeah, so either send me an email. My email is under contact us in the upper right-hand corner of the site. Got it. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to bird dog it, no doubt. I would really appreciate that, and uh, it's great to talk to you, and thank you for the video, and thank you for pointing this out. I'll look at the catalog, but uh, I think this is probably my product, and I'll drop you an email within the next uh, half an hour. Yeah, I, I know more about mid, mid, mid-century than I do about 80s, even though I'm a child of the 80s. Um, okay. And I'm I'm thinking that this is a match for your architectural period. Um, so if you know mid-century, these guys, Buff and Hensman, I guess, are one of the originators of the, you know, the post and beam. But in the 80s, uh, they started doing these big mass volumes in stucco. So, you know, some people call it brutalist. You know, I think that millions of 80s, uh, uh, you know, condos and high-end office buildings adapted this sort of style. of. It's sort of like Schindler, you know, on steroids. It's big, you know, masses of stucco. Um, and so, and everything is very rectilinear. Um, it's, uh, it's a beautiful house, beautiful volumes, but they definitely specified everything. And it was unfortunately you know, got in the hands of a TV designer from HGTV who who messed it a little bit. So we're trying to, you know, get it back to what it was. Yeah, looking at brutalism, I would look in the catalog first because I don't see a okay. lot of circular shapes in brutalism. No, it's mostly square stuff, right? Yeah, so I'd be looking, I'd, I would look for something else just, just so that you, you had a better, 
overall on it. Um, cool. And, you know, you've got something that's going to someday end up being one of a kindish. And, Definitely. you know, whether it be one week or three weeks, I mean, you know, in, in a decade, it ain't going to matter how long it took to get too long. No, it's more important to get it right. I can put yeah. something temporary in there to keep the doors from, you know, banging on the walls while we figure this out. Yeah. But it's interesting in this world of, you know, this stuff that, uh, you know, these are these guys, Lux Door Hardware, who are down in commerce, you know, definitely some sketchy characters. My next call after you is to my credit card company trying to block this payment since they never ordered it, you know? Yeah, I, I don't know who those folks are. Um, and, you know, before you did that, I would just first give them the opportunity to refund you if you've been charged because that's going to cost them. That's going to cost them money to do a chargeback, and it's going to be a waste of your time, possibly. You know. Possibly. Yeah, you know, I, I always, you know, in the once a year I get involved in that, I'm like, listen, I'm going to check back on this in a week. Just make sure we're good. Otherwise, i got to take the gloves off. Okay. Look, I appreciate yeah, I, that. Anyway. I don't want to cause anybody any hardship. I don't like people lying to me. Um, it was disturbing for me to call Rockwood this morning after I had the weird call with them yesterday. They were like, oh, good news. It's back ordered. It'll be here in three days. It's like, wait a minute. You told me it was going to drop ship and be here in a day. And then to find out from Rockwood that they never put an order in. So, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. It's, there's, yeah. Because they, they, they're, <laughs> they're probably waiting to send in their stock order because of the minimum order would be my guess. Oh, uh, interesting. Interesting. That and makes they just, sense. Yeah. I mean, like Corey, they should have been clearer about that. You know, you want to, here's the lead time because of because of the minimum order. And I get it. I've spent, I don't know, whatever time I've spent with you. You know what I get paid per hour? You know what I mean? What what do you I get, get paid per hour? And and to have someone at Rockwood enter an order for fifty forty nine dollars, it's a loss. You know, we take we take the small orders because ten dimes make a dollar. Um so I I understand minimum orders. It's you know no, most, I, most I, manufacturers look, have them. Look, I understand too. You know, we're, we're, I'm in the situation generally in this because, you know, it's not worth it, you know, and for most contractors out here, you know, the ones that are skilled, you know, and have a good body of subs, you know, they want to work on very expensive projects and that's typically, you know, new construction or massive renovations for very wealthy clients. So, you know, the older generation of people that I use are just people that I've come up with who've restored other modern houses, another modern house I had in the past. But I get it, and as for what I do, me, um, I'm I'm on strike now as a as a screenwriter, but uh, I spend most of my time going out to pitches and telling people my great ideas and having people go, that's really interesting. And you know, nine times out of ten, somebody else does it, and boop, you know, maybe twenty twenty five percent of the time, you know, the ideas that you pitch end up in the final movie, but you never get paid for it. So I get it. I do a lot of tech support and specification writing, you know, letting people know this is what you use. Here's the interpretation of the code that I don't monetize. So, yeah, what are you going to do? You know, if you love what you do, you know, but you do have to look at the business and try to, you know, be disciplined about it. And it's something I've had to learn painfully over the years. You know, people call them bake-offs here. And basically it's like, you know, you're all going to bring your best recipe to the bake-off. The only problem is, you know, one guy's going to get pulled, but they're going to take everybody's recipe. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's uh, I understand minimum orders and I understand saying to people, you know, on this one, I'm just not going to participate. You know, I know time, you're probably not yeah. going to hire me. Yeah, there are times when I have to say this is a no bid scenario. I just it's right. It's not healthy for the customer, uh, for the client and and probably not for the customer as well. No, I get it, but it's just it's interesting in this world that uh, you know, there's a race at the bottom in my business as well, which is interesting. You know, people ask me what the strike is about, and I basically said to them, what the strike is about is basically Netflix devaluing, you know, entertainment product and giving people enormous choice and enormous stuff for free, effectively for free, and everybody expecting it all for free. And the the reality is it's unsustainable and, you know, the business of Netflix is like the business of Amazon, which is to drive all your competitors out of business and raise prices later, right? Grab market share and then, you know, beat out all your competitors and then raise the price later. 
um, and also squeeze everybody, right, when you're in, in, a, in a position of, you know, market dominance. And so it's, uh, you know, but the consumer just thinks, oh, it's great, you know, this stuff is free, effectively, you know. And it's, the Amazon it's unsustainable. See, it is un- unsustainable. It's the Amazonification of our culture. And it I, is. I know to be fact what you said about Amazon. I really I don't use them because of what you've said, but I do use Audible. I'm an Audible customer. You know, that's an Amazon property. I would definitely yeah. go to Low Earth Orbit um, with them if I could. But they they are the what we like to say around here is they're scamming. And I know it. Yeah, I know it's, it. You know, e- economically, it's you know the uh, the I guess the economic term is externalities, which means that they're pushing the real cost of their business on other people, right? Like the consumer ultimately, but in the short term, all their suppliers, all their workers, you know. And when it's a, it's it's just destroying my business, to be honest. You know, when when they turned all of the drivers into subcontractors. It's it's a, it's a form of enslavement is what it is because those people are going to find that they're going to work 14 hours a day and they're just going to feel so exhausted April 15th and wonder where the hell is all their money. That's That's the reality of that. And what they also do is get other people to pay to get them the data they need. The data they that's need right. is something like, should I stock this yes or no? You know, should they offer it? Is there enough sales history of a product without them having to test it? They try to get it from Amazon sellers, of which we were for a little while, and then it became really obvious. Scamming. Really obvious. It was too transparent. They should do a better job at hiding it. Jeff Bezos is one of the smartest men in the world, I'm sure. But if you're in industry, then you see it. I think that the reality is they've they've gotten away with it, and there's a certain sort of shamelessness about it now. And honestly, you know, what the strike is about is, you know, it's getting very hard for people who do what I do to make a living. There's a few people that they make gigantic deals with, but that was also a reason for the strike because basically in a strike they can declare act of God and cancel all these expensive deals and get out of these deals, which they've done. So it's pretty naked, and because they're not being called out and they're not being shamed – there's a certain kind of arrogance to how they do it now. I mean, people are shamelessly cheating us. It's amazing. I have, you know, I, I made a movie with Disney and I supposedly have first dollar gross, which means I'm supposed to get one and a half cents of every dollar that comes in. And that's potentially huge. But they send me checks for 19 bucks a year saying, oh yeah, we didn't make any money in your movie last year. And I'm like, really? It's on your Disney site, you know? You're selling DVDs and Blu-rays. I see it on Amazon. You know, you're selling the movie SVOD. So you're really telling me you made two hundred dollars last year on the movie? It's impossible. The IRS doesn't go for that, and I don't believe Disney <laughs> does either. The IRS doesn't allow you to clear a loss, you know, for oh. three years in a row. But you guys have it's a big lot. problem, and that big problem, and I do, I know nothing about the issue. Um, all I know is I want my TV to be good. That's what I want. Um, but your issue is really is I'm sure AI is a big part of this because I, I, I've had AI in the last month do college level trigonometry for me and I didn't take that and I, I'm getting the right answers and it's crazy what's going to happen music it's, images this is the, the dream is that they replace us all with AI oh. what's interesting you know about AI is AI can do many, many things well. And it, and it's good for Hollywood because what Hollywood wants now is they want generic product. But what's historically, the business that I'm in, what's historically sustained and what we talk about when you talk about, you know, designers and architects and people doing unique things is somebody like Quentin Tarantino who comes along and does something completely different. Someone like Chris Nolan comes along and makes a movie that is unpredictably successful. AI is not programmed to do that and maybe can't do that, probably can't do that. Um, that's been a huge sustaining force for our business in the long run. That's the long-term revenue stream. That's the libraries of movies. If you look at the movies that drive the revenue stream, many of them from Blade Runner to Chinatown to The Godfather, not huge blockbusters when they opened, right? 
but perpetual, perpetual money makers, bankable, predictable income streams. Those are all things that came out of big struggles with people trying to do something different. So, you know, what's really going on now is a struggle for the future of this business and people saying, we really don't want to do great or original things. Occasionally, we have to, in a competitive situation, we start Netflix, and to compete, we've got to actually come up with some good stuff to throw a bunch of money at the problem and hope that somebody comes up with something original. But what we'd really like to do, and this is why AT&T sold Warner Brothers to Discovery, is we'd like to make 5,000 episodes of Duck Dynasty that are basically the same. And for that, we, we don't need writers. We need AI. And we may not even need actors. What we really need is for actors to give us their likeness and then have AI, you know, model it on some other body, you know? It, it is. A, so that's what it is. A, it, it, you're, I met one of the two people from that reality show called Tanked. I met him earlier over the summer. Mm-hmm. And he basically told me he's proposing to the studio, whomever it is, a new season. And it's just. And the reason he's promoting it as this reality show is because they don't need they don't need the the the, the writers for this. No, that's and it's and that loophole for you guys needs to be looked at. Listen, everybody has woken up to this now, and people now realize what's going on. But you know what really did it was people realizing oh, wait, the amount of money that's being spent making streaming product is. 400% higher than it was three years yeah. ago. Yeah. But we're collectively making 20% less and half of us are making minimum. So people were, I think, you know, I think about this all the time because I was trained as a lawyer, as an economist, but most writers, they just want to go to work and do their creative thing. They're artists. And, you know, a few of us have seen this coming for a few years and uh, now it's here. So, and, and the greed of the studios is such they did an unthinkable thing, which is they let the actors go on strike at the same time. They were so certain they could starve everybody out and so used to getting their way that they just thought, we don't have to even pretend to care. And I think the strike has been a surprise to them. It's really unfortunate. Um, but it's the way it works is there's a collectivity of all the producers, which just means all the studios. Each of them has a veto. And so Netflix, I think, is holding everybody else hostage. I'm not in the room, but my guess is Amazon and Netflix being in the exploitation business and not being invested in the structure of the business are the ones that don't want to make a deal. Because I know I'm supposed to be running a TV show for AMC. AMC is desperate to make a deal. AMC is going to pay me, you know, a tiny amount of money as a sort of a good faith gesture to say, we still are desperate to be in business with you, but you know, our hands are tied. So this is definitely the, the disruptors, and the exploiters holding an entire business hostage, and nobody knows what it's going to turn out, you know? It's really, it's interesting that you have so much insight into it, but it's definitely part of the Amazon AI, how do we, you know, get into the business of making generic product without paying anybody? I'd rather be in the camp of the Writers Guild than Netflix. Well, I'll tell you what's interesting. Every single one of us, we sign these form contracts, and one part of the contract says, your name and likeness can be used in connection in with perpetuity. this movie. In perpetuity. Exactly right. That's exactly what it says. Yeah. And nobody ever thought about it before. And me, the crazy former lawyer, is like, you know, that's an interesting clause, you know, for yeah. all purposes, for on all manners heretofore, never yet imagined in the future forever. I'm like, that's really a big, big loophole. <laughs> you imagine, could drive a truck I mean, I, through that. I'm a big Star Wars fan, and imagine being Carrie Fisher's family. I mean, they, they're using her yes. likeness. <laughs> There's no money going to them. I'm sure the daughter no. is okay, but I'm sure she could probably, you know, some grandchild with, I, is going to be poor. <laughs> I worked with Carrie, and Carrie made a lot of money writing later in her career, but she was yeah. terrible at managing money yeah. and her family was not left with a gigantic fortune. And yeah. I can tell you that people, this is why Meryl Streep and Jennifer Lawrence, they all wrote a letter to their union leadership that was about to make a deal with the studio saying, don't make a deal that doesn't protect us. Yeah. And it really woke up the, the union leadership to say, oh, we have a problem here because 
if we sign this deal and it ends up being the sort of end of the actors guild, because after this, everybody's replaced by AI, we're going to be the villains of history. You know, it's all it's all going to be extremely low quality content to the point where I not only um, canceled Netflix because of poor quality uh, a few months ago, I let Paramount Plus go. Good for you. Um, and uh, you know, I've got a couple because I need a couple. I, I I have only basic cable, but if the quality of that content continues to degrade, you know what? It's gonna you know it's gonna be local news because I'm not going to pay for they, it. Unless it's not my are, stock off like Andor, I'm not going to pay for it. Listen, Andor is a total... I'll tell you an inside thing about Andor because I know some of the people involved and I've worked with Kathy Kennedy. Andor was... Kathy Kennedy was in trouble because she had so screwed up the Star Wars franchise and she had been very high-handed and very dismissive. She did not want to work with Tony Gilroy. Tony Gilroy is a guy that stands by his guns, was fired on board and rehired by the studio to bring it back and, and save it, you know, the original one. And she did not, she, she does not like working with writers like that. And, but she knew she was in trouble and there was a power struggle and there was a risk that she was going to get pushed out. And so she, that, that like many great things was a fluke desperation play to make something great. The studio did not want Andor. <laughs> I can tell you that from the inside. The studio did not want it. As a former Disney exec, my wife is a former Disney exec, and we know all the people involved. And so we are all incredibly grateful that, you know, there was this moment where they felt, and please don't quote me, please don't put me on any, you know, Star Wars forum, blah, blah, you know. Oh, God, no. Because mm, yeah, not, no. not that I ever want to work with Disney again, but the truth is that that was something that Kathy Kennedy kicking and screaming had to do because she needed some credibility and they needed an Emmy nomination. And so they held their noses and hired Tony Gilroy and, you know, he fought them, you know, whenever you, you go to these conventions and the fan shows and then the, people are going to tell you the sanitized version of it because they all want to continue working with each other. But, you know, the inside version of that, from what I've been told, again, wasn't in the room from what I've been told from sources very close was that, that nobody got it, nobody wanted to make it, and it and they were all, but they were all happy to bask in its success. But that's not what they want to make, you know. I'm 53. I was in the theater when, in 1977, and I've seen wow. everything that has been produced for Star Wars. Rogue One, it's Episode Four, obviously. Episode Five, obviously. But Rogue yeah. One is in the top five for sure. Andor is, for me personally, the best Star Wars that I've ever seen. The writing, Look, I, the acting is phenomenal. The, acting. the writing is irreplaceable. But, you know, listen, anyway. I'll tell you another secret that Hollywood doesn't want to think about. Everybody wants people to be treated like cattle. When actors are given great scripts and great characters, they rise to the occasion. They yeah. want that. They thrive on it. It get, makes them motivated to do better work, you know? Oh. Yeah. It's It's... It's what the business was built on. But, you know, but, the people that have come in now, you know, the corporate types that now run our business, they are completely disinterested in that, you know? It's hard to quantify. It's hard to, you know, that's why AI is the dream. And if, and if they do it, I, know, I don't think any AI is going to write Andor, you know? I don't, it's, it's like... Machine made music versus listening to a bass player like, or, or, or you know, let's say Stevie Ray Vaughan, that won't be replaced by anything artificial. The tone, well, you're not going to get the I'm, tone. I'm, to, to give you an insight, here's, because obviously you were a smart guy that watches this stuff, here's what's really telling, okay? Disney, th there was very, very little work done promoting Andor for awards. You know what I mean? They got some critics, they knew they were going to get the nomination. It's not Disney's business. Disney did not spend money to chase the awards the way that, you know, it, that HBO Max did, that Warner Brothers did for Succession. And it shows. And or should have swept, you know? I couldn't get but through this, the second episode. I, I got through the first episode of that show, and I'm like, I'm done. I'll rewatch Andor before I do, before I push on. <laughs> now, I know a lot of people loved it, but it's no Breaking Bad. It is no Breaking Bad. It is no Breaking Bad. And that's another thing. I mean, I know Tony Gilroy, and he... 
you know, I think that script stuck around for 10 years and before someone took a crazy flyer on Breaking Bad. But this is, look, this is the pain of my life. This is the pain of the business. And we know, we know what fans want. We know that fans know the difference. But increasingly, our lives are dictated by middle managers, many of whom have no creative background whatsoever. They're business people. Or they're politicians who came up through the ranks. They were somebody's executive. I mean, Iger made his former assistant, like the head of content for all of Disney. It's like she was great at answering your calls. She might be smart and great, but, you know, and two years later, she's gone. So she it's no Bobby I. No, I, I got to tell you, we're really, really, really grateful. You know, when we heard that Kathy was going to hire Tony for Andor, we were like, really? How's that going to work out? They're, those two are going to be at each other's throat. She's going to do everything she can to sabotage him. When it came out, we were like, holding our breath because we were like, let's see how much he was able to push through. It was amazing. We were like, holy cow. I can't believe this is Disney. I can't believe this is Lucasfilm. I can't believe this is Star Wars. They finally let somebody do something great. And Rogue One is an example of that as well. It's a shiny. Rogue One is totally an example of that. And, you know, the truth is if you look at Rogue One, it's, it's not a secret, you know, why, you know, the people involved in that you know, didn't come back, right? <laughs> I will. I, I, is Tony Gilroy not doing um, the new AI movie coming out? He's doing something big that's coming. Um, yeah, and, you know, supposedly he is. But, it, but you know, what's interesting is if you look at, you know, Rogue One, you know, they didn't bring Tony back after Rogue One because he, you know, he, he rewrote, you know, the Chris White's original screenplay, right? And they didn't bring him back. It was a couple of years, right? I mean, so it's very, very interesting. Even in his success with Rogue One, Pete, they would rather make generic crap. It's safer to them. You know, they feel comfortable. It feels predictable to them. It's just, I hate to say it, but it's definitely a corporate culture that they, that, that is uncomfortable with originality, which is a bizarre thing in a, in a in a creative business. I hope, I hope that the stress of being starved out does not prove too great because truly, this is David versus Goliath, Goliath and you guys, you've got the slingshot and the rock. It's, your writers are going to win in the end because there's no other way to do well, it. Well, you know, I think that for me, I'm a little bit older than you and I've been through the ups and the downs and I would say that for me, it'll probably end my career. We'll see. Um, you know, AMC still seems to want to make my series. We'll see. But it's mostly for the younger writers to give a younger generation a chance to come up and get some experience and get the chops to be the younger generation that carries these stories forward. I mean, that's what the fight's about for the older guys like us. It's yeah. probably done for us. But, you know, I know the AI is not going to work out, but there's going to be so much damage and disruption if they pour billions of dollars into it. I had a friend who was a coder, and he worked for Morgan Stanley for four or five years, getting paid gigantic money trying to build an AI that could predict the stock market. They poured close to a billion dollars into it, he told me. I don't know if that's accurate, but, you know, he was certainly getting paid a fortune. He was one small cog in the big machine, and they never figured it out. (laughs) He never found the model that could help them get even a 2%, you know, 3% uh, edge over the market. So my instinct is, they're never, ever going to be able to even get AI to do, you know, better than Gilligan's Island level stuff. But, you know, that's, I mean, that's what they'll want to – if they can sell that to people, that's what they'll sell, right? There's always going to be, need, be a need for Gilligan's Island. There's always going to be a need for people to deliver pizza. <laughs> but I don't know that I'm going to pay Amazon Prime for that. No, that's right. And, you know, people are starting to wake up to the fact that, you know – they thought all this was free, and now by the time all the rising prices and all the streaming services, when they package together everything, they're paying what they used to pay. But, you know, it's not as good as it was five or seven years ago when they were taking chances. So I, I know that it will sort itself out in time, but, you know, I think it's, you know, they're pretty determined to try to break the union and starve us all out and, you know, force us to either work for nothing or, um, you know, find other jobs. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens in the short run. But it, I got to tell you, it's been fascinating to have this conversation with you because lots of people have asked me about it because of what's going on. But 
I, I haven't talked to one person that has the insight that you do about the structure of the business and even telling people that what it's basically about is the Amazonification of, you know, the movie business. People still don't get it. I'm like, this is how the, this is how this business model works, right? You know, this is, this is part of the game plan. That's why it's happening. It's not, the writers going out. This was always going to happen. This was part of the plan. Your upcoming yeah. project. I, I hope that Thank AMC you. is able to do something. I just, you know, I know the home of Breaking Bad. You know, but you know, AMC is sure. struggling too. So that's always good. When they're struggling, it means they're willing to actually take a chance on something great. So, well, fingers it's crossed. Worked in the past. It has. Thank you very much. I'll drop you an email. It's been a great pleasure talking to you, man. Pleasure was mine, sir. Thank you. And I'll go. I'll, You'll see me on the news tonight. I'm going to run over to Disney and carry my sign. <laughs> I'll, you later. I'll watch for that. Appreciate it. Architectural Builders Supply hopes you have enjoyed this program. Again, thank you for watching. And if you've enjoyed this video, please click thumbs up. Please subscribe and maybe even send the video to someone that you know. Thank you.